Thank you, Jeff, for reading of the scripture and for praying for us. Uh, today's scripture, as you have, as Jeff has read, is John chapter 15, verses 18 through 27. Um, <clears throat> and today's sermon title is called Abiding Through Pain. Modern Christianity does indeed have a problem, which Jeff just shared with each and every one of us. And the big problem that modern Christianity has, which is what he called heresy, is this idea that it stems from many people thinking that becoming a Christian immediately solves all of our problems. There is a lot of teaching out there, and many of it does come from the health and wealth gospel, the prosperity gospel, where they say that if you just believe in Jesus Christ, everything will be fine. Your finance will come in order, there will be no sickness, you can pray all of these things off. And so a lot of people have this, have disappointments in their life when their Christian life, once they become a Christian, it doesn't seem to live out the way the person on TV, the preacher on TV is saying it's supposed to be. And so what ends up happening is many of these disappointments come because God isn't who we expected him to be. And like he preached, like Pastor Jeff preached about uh, two months ago, um, he preached about the two disciples who were walking to the road to Emmaus, and they were disappointed in the death of Jesus Christ. Why? Because if you look in Luke, if you look in that um, pericope, you'll see that they were saying, you know, we thought this Jesus was going to come and save us. We thought that this Jesus was going to come and save us from Roman oppression and from all the taxation that Rome has on us and all the financial hardships that we had. We thought Jesus was going to come and like a ride on a white horse and come save each and every one of us. But he died. You didn't hear the news that this guy Jesus died on a cross? And they were all disappointed. The danger... This ideology stems from Christianity becoming a religion to many people, whereas it should rather be a relationship with the Father. And the danger of this sort of thinking, of prosperity gospel thinking of modern Christianity is that many Christians believe that having faith, if you just have enough faith, it'll solve all of your problems. But try telling that to a person who is dying of cancer and they're only 30 years old. Try telling that to somebody who loses a mother all of a sudden from a drunk and driving accident. Try telling that to somebody who just lost their child after carrying them for seven months in the womb. This ideology does not hold up in these difficult circumstances of life. And as we have been going through the Gospel of John together as a church, this subset where you see particularly in chapters 13 all the way through 18, this subset of personal teachings from Jesus to his disciples can shed some light to the solution of the problem that Christianity is facing today. I don't think I need to remind each and every one of you of the news that is going on this past week, but um, I am not here to talk about political agendas. I am not here to tell you what I believe in or what not, but I do want to say one thing about the events of this week. <clears throat> I am really saddened by the divide that I am clearly seeing in our country today. I'm not telling you what I believe in. I am not telling you what side of the fence I stand on. You know what I am telling you? I am telling you that I am seeing people that are angry, upset, nobody is talking to each other. 
There's hundreds of people that are hurting, and that's why they are marching. And the thing that we do is we put signs across their faces and say, we're right, we won. That is not the way to, to harbor community and love. And I, this is why I, I'm not going to ever say anything about my political beliefs on this pulpit. This is not the place to do it. But I will say one thing for sure. A, a topic such as Roe versus Wade is divisive in its nature. And the way it is, you know, and the clarification that we are wanting, it's just not happening and it, it's dividing people, split down the middle. And I am really hurting for all the people who are hurt on both sides of the fence, guys, on both sides. Because we just keep screaming at each other and we're not talking to each other and trying to understand the other person. A lot of this comes from, stems from the fact that we are somewhat, we, it, it is selfish in our nature to want things. And Christianity is no different. When Christianity becomes a religion to us, we want things from God. And when we don't get those things that we want from God, then we are disappointed, as Pastor Jeff uh, spoke about a couple weeks ago. So the outline to talk about this scripture today is, number one, the cost. We're going to talk about the cost. Then number two, we're going to talk about the model. And then number three, we're going to talk about the response. So very simply, today's scripture verse, we're going to go through by talking about the cost, the model, and the response. Number one, the cost of following Jesus. Look at what Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse 18 through 19. He says this, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world that is why the world hates you. Right off the bat, what Jesus is saying here is he is saying that he never promised us a rose garden. As a matter of fact, every time, if you look at when Jesus asks people to follow him, he will always, he many times mentions that they must take up their cross and follow after him. In that day and age, the cross was not an accessory you wear on a necklace. In that day and age, the cross represented capital punishment. And so what Jesus was saying by saying, if you want to follow me, you must pick up your cross and follow me. What he was trying to say was there is a cost to following Christ. Not only does he say that there is a, a cross to, fall, to bear, but I don't know if you remember in Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, he mentions to three people, he says, come follow me. And then, the, and then he tells one person, you know what? Birds have nests and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Do you know what he was telling that guy that was wanting to follow him? He was basically saying, you're going to be homeless. I don't have a place to lay my head, so you won't either. Come, follow me. That person, it says, didn't follow. And then not only that, but afterwards he says to the other guy, the guy says, I want to follow you, but let me first bury my father. And then he tells him, hey, let the be dead bury the dead. What Jesus was simply saying to all of the people who were about to follow him is that there is a cost to following Jesus. Anything in this world that is worth something comes at a cost, does it not? If you want to raise good children, it comes at a cost. You have to invest your time, your energy, and your money into them. 
Children just don't get born and come out, bing, like in an oven, like automatic. It's, it's not automatic. You have to instill values in them. You have to instill rules for the family. You have to invest money into them and all of those things. If a professional athlete wants to be the best at what they are, they come at a, it comes with a sacrifice. They sacrifice their bodies. They beat it all day long. They wake up four in the morning to go running and to eat the good foods that they need to eat. They sacrifice everything so that they can be the best that they could be. In the same way, what Jesus is saying about Christianity is he is saying, if you want to follow me, it comes at a cost. But modern Christianity has lost the essence of Jesus' teaching about the cross of following Christ. We have lost this because many times we teach that Christianity is an easy, it's, it's a, it doesn't really cost anything, and we make it easy to follow Christ by following a life that's filled with riches and comfort and good health and all of these things that are nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does Jesus ever say that if you follow me, you're going to lead a good life. As a matter of fact, he says it right here, and he's telling us all, if the world hates you, keep in mind, it hated me first. And if it belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. So Jesus is telling his followers, his disciples, that if you're going to follow me, there's a cost to be paid. Number two, we're going to talk about the model. Jesus is our model. Look at what he says here in the next few verses, in, in, in verses 20 to 21. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will. Not they might, not the if, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know. Look at this. I'm just going to read, I'm going to emphasize this line. For they do not know the one who sent me. Notice here that Jesus says the world will, not if, the world will persecute you just as they persecuted him. When Jesus went around healing people, as we saw throughout the book of John, I don't, I don't need to mention the entire list of all that he's done, but if you see all the things that Jesus did in, in doing good works, he, he healed people and he saved them. But every time he did this, notice the Pharisees and the teachers of the law persecuted Jesus even more for healing the sick. You would imagine that people who are connected to God would be happy that God is healing these people. But instead, they were angry and they got even more upset. And they treated, and they, and they treated this way. Why? Because they didn't know God's heart. Look at what Jesus says in the, in the end of this verse. It says, and I repeated it for emphasis. They will treat you this way because of my name. Why? For they do not know the one who sent me. Many people in Jesus' time, and not only in Jesus' time, but even today, did not know the heart of the Father. They did not have a personal relationship with God. That is why many people had the mindset of Judaism as being just simply a religion to follow. I don't know if you know this, but 
uh, according to the Jewish laws, there were 618 different sundry laws that they had to follow. And they had to follow each and every one of them perfectly so that they can say, hey, I'm a good Jew. I'm a good follower of God. I do this, 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 and this. And they were complaining to Jesus saying, you don't do any of these laws. You're not following the Sabbath. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. And they, they got angry at Jesus for not following his, you know, for not following all the laws to the T. And what Jesus is saying here is that they are doing these, they, they are doing these things because they don't know the Father in an intimate way like I know him. This is what Jesus is saying. When, when Christianity or Judaism or any other religion becomes just a religion to follow, we start to get this mindset in our lives to say, you know what, God? I did this, this, and this, and that is why you should do this, this, and that. Do you see how that is connected? The more we look at the more we look at anything, Christianity, Judaism, any religion, if you look at it as just a set of rules to follow, what ends up happening is we lose this relationship we have with God and we actually become a, uh, we, it becomes a set of lists that we have to check mark. And the more we check those lists, the more we think that we have right standing with God. And the more we think we have more right standing with God, the more we start to expect that God is not a father, but more of like a cosmic butler where he is to do what we ask him to. And that is why what Pastor Jeff mentioned in his previous sermon, that is why a lot of people get disappointed. They say things such as, you know what, I went to church every week, I gave tithes and offering all the time, I did Bible study all the time, and the more I did these things, but why am I sick now? Why am I in the hospital? Why do I have this, this disease? Why did the doctor have to find this? Or why did my children have to be this way? And they start to think that God owes them something because of the checklists that they started to put down one by one. If we look at the if you look at if we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus did not obey the Father because of what Jesus can get out of the relationship. You never saw Jesus healing people and then saying, you know what, I just healed him. God, I did a good job, right? Now I want you to give me this. He never did that. Rather, Jesus obeyed the Father as a result of having a close and intimate relationship with the Father. This is the model that we are being invited to follow as what Jesus is saying here in his teaching. And if I can use another famous person's words, I thought John F. Kennedy did a great job you know, when he said, ask not what your country can do for you. But let me put it in a different way. I would use his line to say, ask not what your father can do for you. But rather, ask what you can do for the father. Do you see a difference? There is a stark difference in that type of thinking. Instead of thinking God as somebody who, oh God, I want you to do this, this, and this for me. Ask him, God, what pleases you? What are the things that you are interested in, God? And even in the midst of this world and the way everybody is acting in this world, God, how do you want me to be? I guarantee you, you will find a better way to live when you ask those questions. When you ask the questions, God, what's in your heart? What would you like me to be? What would you like me to give to others? How would you want me to do that? When you start asking questions like that, that is the, 
That is the entryway to having a personal relationship with God. Instead of, God, oh, I have 10 minutes I have left to do my QT. Or, oh, God, I, you know, I pray today. Do you remember? I pray. It's, it's not a checklist. It's more of a relationship. And that is what Jesus is calling his disciples to enter into. Have a relationship with the Father. So number one, we talked about Jesus' teaching here is that there is a cost to following him. And number two, that Jesus is the model that we should be following. And so number three, let's end with our third point, the response. Jesus' response. So let's take a look at verses 25 and 26. Now, I apologize ahead of time. Um, I did not... I made a mistake of just ending your notes, um, the scripture reading to the uh, to verse 25, but I meant to finish it all the way to the end, and I, it was my mistake, so I apologize. But let me, let me read to you what's in verse 25 and 26. But this is, to fill, this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. When the advocate comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. He will testify about me. Throughout the life of Jesus, and as we've been looking throughout the book of John, the Gospel of John, we see that Jesus faced so much hatred he faced so much opposition, and Jesus faced so much persecution. But in all those times that he was hated, oppressed, persecuted, did he ever once retaliate and double down against his prosecutors? Think about that for a moment. Like if you had the power of God, you were God's own son, and you came down to this earth, and you had all of this power, and you had people spitting on you, you had people making fun of you, you had people doubting you, you had people persecuting you, hating you, oppressing you. What would you do with that power? What would you do with the power when people are putting all this suffering upon you? If I'm being honest, I think I would use some of that power to get revenge. Honestly. I think that's my nature as a sinful human being. I would use that power. But never once did Jesus retaliate and fight back and argue against these Pharisees like with hatred. He argued against them, but in wisdom, he did that, but not in hatred. And he never, he never punished somebody else for their wrong theology and their you know, misunderstanding of Jesus. Never once did he do that. No. As a matter of fact, we see his exact response here at the end of verse 26. Look at what he says. In the midst of all this hatred and opposition and anger towards him and this persecution, look at what he says in verse 26. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Do you see what he is doing here? The way Jesus responds to the burden of hatred, opposition, and persecution is that he leaves it up to the Father to testify about him. He doesn't go around and try to prove himself and say, you know, hey, I know everything and I'm the man and you should listen to me. He doesn't do this. He doesn't double down on their hate and return it for other hate. Instead, look, instead of exacting revenge against his enemies and taking matters into his own hands, Jesus depends everything. He leaves everything for the Father. 
to take care of. He says the Holy Spirit will testify against me. I mean, will testify for me, about me. And finally, not only does Jesus willingly, uh, not only does Jesus depend upon the Father for all these things, but in the, sea, in the midst of all of his opposition, in the midst of all of his persecution, what does Jesus do? He goes on a cross to die for the very people that are oppressing him and persecuting him. That's the power of, of the cross. Instead of him exacting revenge on people who have been persecuting him, instead, do you know what he does? He trusts, he entrusts the Father fully. This is why in that garden of Gethsemane, that prayer before he is about to be crucified, he goes to that garden and he says, Father, if you can just pass this burden away from me, would you take this cup away from me? He asks that, but instead he says, you know what? At the end of his prayer, he says, but not my will be done, but whose? But God's will be done. Do you see Jesus, his response to all the haters was to depend more fully and trust more dependingly upon God. That was his response. And in a world like today, where we see a lot of hatred for each other, and we have a lot of opposition, and there's a lot of suffering that we, even as Christians, we experience, what should our response be? There's only one of two responses. One way is to get even more angry and say, oh, I can't believe my mom, you you gave my mom cancer. Oh, I can't believe that that you know, drunk driver killed my brother. Oh, I can't believe this, this, and this, and that. We can double down on our anger and get even more angry and start blaming people and saying it's your fault. This is why our country is like this. The left is arguing with the right. The right is arguing with the left. Nobody can come to any agreement. Or we can put all of our trust and all of our faith and all of our hope and saying, God, I don't know what you're doing. Please take this cup away from me. This suffering is too much. But in the end to say, but not my will be done, but yours be done. You know, uh, Pastor Jeff mentioned it in his prayer about this, this concept of while suffering, God is chiseling at our character. This is what I want to end today's sermon with is in Deuteronomy chapter 8, 2 to 5. There is no other people group that have known suffering like the Jews have known. I'm talking about Moses. And when he was um, setting the captives free and he was bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, look at what Moses says to the whole congregation, the entire Jewish population, look at what he says. He says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 to 5, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man, disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Oh, man, do you see what Moses is saying at the last, very end of this verse? Just as a man disciplines his son. Look at the word, the language he's using. He's using a relationship between the father and the son. 
What even Moses back then was trying to say, Judaism is not a religion. Where we cross our T's and dot our I's. And we have this checklist that we go down to test the Lord. Don't do that. The Lord is your father. And all these years he has taken care of you. But in the midst of taking care of you, what did you do? You complained. You, you, you got angry at God. And you were saying, it's his fault that we're here. Why don't we just go back to Egypt? Why don't we go back to slavery? Oh, it's God's fault. And what Moses is saying is, you guys have missed the point. You've missed the point of the reason why God did this. Just as a father disciplines his son, he is disciplining you to see at the very end what is in your heart. When suffering, persecution, and even pain in our lives, in our Christian lives, when they come, what is it going to be at the core of our heart? Are we going to shake our hands against God and say, oh, I can't believe you did this to me after all I've done for you? Or are we going to be like Jesus and say, I depend fully on you. I am going to let him, the Holy Spirit, minister to me. And I am going to let him be the avenger of all the wrongs that have happened in my life. God, I fully depend on you. That is the response that Jesus was encouraging his disciples to go after. Let's pray. Father, <clears throat> there is inevitably going to be suffering and pain and persecution that is coming our way. When we have said yes to you, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior, some of us have lost family members. Some of us have lost friendships. Father, I know I have lost many friendships because I decided I was going to follow Jesus. And they all told me I was crazy. And they said, why would you quit your job? Why would you quit everything that is good in your life? And why would you become a pastor? Father, but I know that in all those dark times, Father, in all those lonely times, Father, you have been my refuge. You have been my strength. Father, and I pray that when everyone here goes through those dark times in their life, when they are questioning, even maybe perhaps, and it's good to question your existence. Are you real? Do you really love me, God? Why do I feel so alone? Help them to know that Jesus felt the same way when he was on that cross and he shouted, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But to the very end, Jesus trusted in you. He depended upon you. And you rose him up on the third day in glorious splendor cut out from a rock you burst it out from that rock and you gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord so Father as our Lord and as our Savior prepare us as a people to expect persecution because there's a cost. But also remind us as a people that in times like that, we need to depend even more on you and cling to you so that you would know what's really in our hearts. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.